All right, so let's take a look at the basic oral surgery tray setup that I have in my office. This is the setup with the instruments that I use to treat every patient that walks in the door. Uh, any type of extraction, any tooth, this is what I'm going to use. I don't have any uh, storage of secret instruments that I go to for really difficult teeth. Uh, this is it, and this is, this is all you need to get the job done. If you prefer other instruments or you, you really have taken a liking to some certain instrument, that's fine. There's more than you know one way that you can do this. But I want to express to you guys that when you've learned how to master these instruments, you really can do any extraction. You, you don't need to have uh, a storage of you know 100 different forceps. Uh, it's just learning how to effectively and properly use the forceps and the elevators and the instruments that you have in your office. So what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through here these basic instruments uh, and just a, a little bit about how they're used and then we'll go over in depth uh, when we're doing the, the practical videos to kind of show you those instruments in action. Some of these are very basic and you may be familiar with them but I'm going to go over everything. So let's jump right in. The first instrument that we're going to look at is the dental syringe. Everyone is familiar with this, but nonetheless, it has to go on the tray. We have to keep patients adequately numb to be able to perform oral surgery procedures effectively. So obviously, that's an important one. Second, this is one that sometimes uh, general dentists aren't as familiar with, uh, but it is one, at least as an oral surgeon, that we, we use every day, every procedure. And this is the Minnesota Retractor. The reason that we like this instrument and that you should consider using it is that it is what we use to effectively uh, a retract the cheek you can kind of pull the cheek back and i do that you know when i'm giving local anesthesia or any procedure that i need visualization i'm pulling that cheek out of the way the second reason that this is a a, a, a tool that i use on on every procedure is that any time that i'm reflecting a flap this is the end that i'm placing under the flap to hold that flap out of my way so that I don't damage the flap during the surgery. Uh, this is what protects the soft tissues and protects the patient. Highly effective instrument, very easy, one that you should get familiar with using. Next, let's jump over here and look at forceps and we'll kind of work down the line. The first forcep is the workhorse. This is the 150 universal forcep. Now technically, this is a universal maxillary forcep. The reason that they're indicating this as a maxillary forcep is primarily the angulation here. Uh, however, I don't even like to call it a maxillary universal forcep. That is the correct name. But for me in my practice, this is simply a universal forcep. I use this in all areas of the mouth and I can take out any tooth with this forcep, whether it's maxillary or mandibular. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you how. Uh, this is uh, also one of my favorites actually for lower wisdom teeth. And that's in part because of the angulation. So very effective. If you only have one instrument in the practice, this would be it. Next, we have the ash or bird beak forcep. Again, one that you're probably familiar with, uh, you probably already have in your practice. This is one that I like to use on premolar teeth as well as anterior teeth, both maxillary and mandibular. It's also highly effective at removing roots. Not necessarily root tips, but when a root fractures, uh, this is a good go-to instrument. The last and the only forcep that I use is a cow horn forcep. This is what I prefer for mandibular molar teeth. As you can see, this forcep has a curved kind of um, prong uh, look to it, and those are designed to fit in between the roots, the frication on the roots of a mandibular uh, molar, and use some sort of a wedge technique where the apical pressure of this pushing down on the tooth wedges the tooth up. And uh, this is just, uh, I find, very effective at, at mandibular molars. I don't use it anywhere else in the mouth. Next, we have a needle driver. A needle driver is something that you will need in your practice if you're going to be doing suturing. If you're going to be doing surgical extractions, you will be doing suturing. I want to emphasize that this is not a hemostat. A hemostat and a needle driver are different. A needle driver comes with cross hatching, which is the little design on the beak there that allows this to properly grip a needle. 
A hemostat does not have that, and you cannot effectively or properly grip a needle. So a needle driver is used to hold the needle. I don't like to do anything else with it. I don't take out any roots or root tips with it. It can damage the instrument. This is designed solely for my suturing. Next, we have a scissor. I prefer a Dean scissor. It has a little bit of a curve to it. And this will be for cutting your sutures. Nothing crazy. Just you have to have something to do the job. Next, we have a hemostat. Now this, again, is different than a needle driver. A hemostat does not have cross-hatching. A hemostat has more of a serrated edge. It is not cross-hatched. And the hemostat is often curved, and that's what I prefer. This is actually a mosquito hemostat. Now, in the operating room, these are used for clamping blood vessels, uh, for tying off vessels to prevent bleeds or to stop a bleed. That's not what you're going to be using it for in your private office. However, I do like to have them on the tray. They are very useful for uh, picking up small pieces of roots or root fragments. Sometimes you have a tooth you're taking out, maybe an old amalgam filling and things crumble, get in the wound. Um, these can be effective at picking up those little pieces uh, or even little pieces of bone fragments that have kind of sloughed off and might be in the area. Uh, you just want something small, accurate that you can grab them with. That's what this is most commonly used for in the private office. Next, we have an Adson forcep. Uh, there's uh, different types of forceps that you can use for suturing. The Adson uh, is the smaller version. There's Gerald's and some others that are longer. The key with these particular instruments is that they have a little set of teeth at the end. And what that does is it allows you to, as atraumatically as possible, grab and manipulate the tissue around you for suturing. Um, you can also use them to hold tissue should you need to for other purposes. Uh, but these, these don't crush the tissue. They allow you to grab it and manipulate it as atraumatically as possible. Next, we have a bone file. A bone file is an instrument with, again, a little bit of a serrated edge. That edge of the bone file is what allows you to smooth, and in a back and forth motion, a bone following a surgical extraction. That helps prevent any bone spicules, any sharp edges that might be uncomfortable to the patient, or that might be risk of infection. Now, this particular design is actually designed to operate on a pole just so you know. So obviously you're going to use a back and forth motion when you're doing it, but be aware that the cutting is on the pole. That's the, the, the action that you should emphasize uh, to ensure that your bone is being smoothed adequately. Next, we have a root tip pick. The root tip pick uh, is a double-ended instrument. It also comes in, in, in single ends, but I prefer the double-ended instrument. This is what's going to allow you to get actual root tips out, those small portions of the roots that fracture, maybe two to three millimeters in, in length, um, and you need a small, uh, sharp instrument that you can wedge down in between and basically wiggle that root tip loose, and this is very effective at that. We have a curette on the tray. I always have a curette. I do not always curette every socket. You do not need to curette every socket, and we'll go over the indications for that later on. But when you do need to curette a socket, this is what you'll use. And uh, it's obviously something that you don't want to have to go to the back for every time. It's used frequently enough that I have it on the tray. 